Actually, I was drafted because I was in last year high school. And, uh, but I went on and uh, went into service because uh, I was 18 and, and uh, they knew where I was at. <laughs> so I went to uh, Fort McClellan and uh, I passed all their things over there and they thought I'd make a good Marine. So that's, I accepted the Marines. Well, I didn't, a whole, didn't know a whole lot about the difference, but uh, I, I thought that uh, I would probably take the Army because I would probably get to go home because I knew what, a, what the jobs that the Marines have to do. And uh, so, but I'm proud I stayed with the Marines. Well, naturally, uh, uh, everybody knows what a, a drill sergeant is. I mean, it's, it's really people getting up in your face and hollering and everything. But I took it all in. I didn't care. Well, um, I had to uh, train on the, on the rifle range and uh, bayonet and all different kind of climbing ropes and all that stuff. But it just so happened that I felt like I was in pretty good shape because it was in the latter part of the year when I was playing football and I was in shape. That helped a lot. Well. I, they give me a sharpshooters. Well, it's certain you either marksman or sharpshooter or, or I've got excellent or something. Active training. Okay. Well, I spent some time at Camp Pendleton, and uh, the, another camp there close by, and then then. Uh, we we went back to San Diego where I left to go overseas in 1944, and we were destined to go to uh, Hawaii. Well, I got over there and uh, disembarked, and we had uh, we didn't know, but we were just going to stay three days. Well. It, that after three days, I would have been off of quarantine. I could have went down to Honolulu, but that didn't work out. They loaded us on a, a Dutch ship, and I was uh, I would have helped with getting the food for the men. We had on this Dutch ship, we had give them uh, ox tongue sandwiches, <laughs> which is very good. I learned to like them all right. I was trained to be a uh, cooks and bakers because I had worked at uh, the Breeder Bakers in Gaston for three months, and I told them I, I worked there, and they said, well, you can take being the tanks or the cooks and bakers. So I took the cooks and bakers. We, we, that was when we boarded this ship, uh, the Dutch ship, and we went straight for Anna Wetox Island. Okay, the war on Guam was being raised at that time, and our boatload of people were, we were going to be replacements for the people who, in the 3rd Marine Division, needed to be replaced from injuries in, on Guam. So we stayed at, at this Anawetok Island for 30 days. We got off the island one time, a little, must have been a half, a, half an acre a little island out there and, and had some cold drinks over there and uh, but I'll never forget it we we got off the island but that was swimming around and uh, I remember diving off the ship out of the pool diving that far off the quarter deck <laughs> I could broke my neck but uh, yeah we we finally set sail in From from uh, from Hawaii and went to uh, Guam. And that was September the September nineteen forty four. Yes, that's when I was resigned to the Third uh, Marine Division. Well, I went to. We had to uh, 
I read my, we needed cooks, so I, I helped the cooks in some of these big restaurants, uh, what restaurants uh, they call them. <laughs> but uh, some of them had a thousand people in it. Cooking that many for a thousand, which I, I didn't mind. Yes, it was secure. Guam was secure. secure. Uh, we went by an island on the way over there called Rota, and it had Japanese on it, but uh, they couldn't they couldn't do anything about it because we kept bombing airfields, and uh, they couldn't they couldn't take off. I stayed on Guam until I left to go to Iwo Jima, which was uh, in in uh, February. Nineteen forty-five, and then after about three weeks on Iwo Jima, I, I was shipped back to Guam at home base, and I, I was wounded on the fourteenth day of uh, March. Well, I, they I, they put me in the headquarters company, which meant that uh, I had. I, I, did what the sergeant wanted me to do. And he would call out when there was a man down that needed, you know, need to be carried back. Well, uh, four of us guys would go get, get him and take him back, and uh, we would uh, be, uh, help him take uh, these communication lines back and forth. They had some big old walkie-talkies that was big and heavy. So I had to carry ammunition right to the men that worked. Uh, he'd, the sergeant would call out, say, Schwartz, uh, which news is about out of ammunition up there. Go up there and get, go back and get them some. So uh, I'd go back and I'd, the ammunition boxes had 50 rounds in them, I think, and they were they weighed about 50 pounds. <laughs> so uh, when I'd take off over this field, they were naturally firing at you. So I would stoop over real low. And this one particular time, I stooped over and I had these, this weight on me. I stooped over and running and, and trying to, to do this and do that. All of a sudden, I fell over with a pain in my gut. I thought, oh my, I'm I'm hit. I got to pulling around. It was just a cramp. <laughs> but I went back, uh, and uh, another time I had to. Uh, uh, another fellow and I had to take back. Had to go get some hand grenades, and another box of something. What the other guy was taking, and they, we had to put this on our shoulders, and we went up through there. It must have been about a half an acre, and um, you, I couldn't dodge too much with that much weight on me. Well, machine guns fired at us, and he 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 was he hit that box that that fellow was out next to, and it knocked it from off his shoulder, and he fell backwards, and well naturally I squatted down on the ground, but this this I won't forget this guy <laughs> he was sort of nutty anyway, but. He raised his hand and stood up there, and he was cussing the Japs, cussing the Japs. <laughs> I said, get down, you F-O-double-L. So, so it's it just stuff like that going all along. And, uh, well, let me ask you something. Sure. If you're carrying grenades and being shot at. Yeah. What are you thinking here? I mean, if, if somebody hit you, you would be... There wouldn't be nothing left but me. All they had grenades. And it could very possibly happen because, you see, our grenades, uh, they had a handle. You pull the pin out, you know, and let that handle fly off. That sets off a, a fire that goes down into the bottom of that thing and then it explodes. And about 45 pieces go zinging out. And they do make a racket. Zinging out hand grenades. I don't know whether I was scared or whether I was just chilly. <laughs> But I had a job to do, and I did it the best I knew how. And I was, I did my duty. And uh, 
One one time uh, early in the morning, we were taking a man out on stretcher, and uh, we went by this opening in a cave there, and uh, I'd, I'd got past him there, and all of a sudden it was it was sort of like sounded like a firecracker went off right behind us, and one of the guys behind me says, "All right, knock it off." He thought it was a hand grenade. But the guy had took a, it was a real grenade, and I had a, gren a carbine in my right arm that I could swing that thing around because I couldn't use the M1 like that I was trained to use. But that M, uh, that carbine, I could swing it around, and I saw a silhouette of a man in that cave. Well, I fired a bunch of rounds in there, and uh, and either I hit something, or he blew us up, but the the whole thing blew up and knocked us all down. And this was a, this was one of the hills above Mount Suribachi. You see, Mount Suribachi was about 550 feet above sea level. Okay, uh, on a little piece up there, the, the hills got to be higher, 360 feet, and each one of them hills had a lot of japs in it, and they had to be taken. Well, we had to take, uh, since we were new, well, actually, see, when I went on board the island, it was, was, it was no fire. I could walk on the island. Well, that, that night, there was a field out there that we had, we, we had to go, and we, we dug foxholes. And this was getting pretty late at night. We dug foxholes. Well, during the night, they would send mortars in there, and uh, it, it would land one close to you and and throw dirt in the cave or in your foxhole. Well, that was sort of a harrowing experience. So uh, our third division, we helped take that number two airstrip, and they fought that bitterly. Well. Mostly what I was doing was what, you know, either carrying people out or or doing orders what the top sergeant wanted. And uh, I remember looking out there wouldn't be that night and you could see the Japs on that ridge over there going across from one gun pavement to the next. And they they had what they call a screaming meanie. And it was a something they set off. I don't know if it's a mortar. Of what? It was the devilish noise you've ever heard in your life, and that that was scared. That scared a lot of people. But this, this, this was a, a. A lot of the men had to go across that airfield to get to the other side, and it, they raked with raking it with fire, you know, machine gun fire. And um, at night, I had to get up out of my foxhole and take ammunition to each one of these people, their foxhole, the uh, gun emplacements, machine gun nests, resupply them with water, K ration, C ration, ammunition, and uh, and with some luck. <laughs> and they made it, I'll tell you. And uh, well, on, on one instance, we were carrying a man, man back, and uh, uh, there was a, one of these star shells, and I could see, and there was two Japs in the hole in front of the shell hole, and uh, they were playing dead. I could almost post it. So we set the men down right quick, and then I, uh, I had my car being forced on them. But anyway, uh, the light was fixing to go out, so I decided I'd better take them out. So I, I took them out because, because, because I had responsibility of that man and these men behind me. And uh, so I, they, they were alive, I could tell then on the ground. But I got some stuff off of them that I brought back. Some, I bought a hand grenade and some writing materials, stamps, and but 
we had time, and I shouldn't have been fooling with somebody, but I did. So we we went on, and pretty close to the end of the, the campaign, there we were carrying a man that had been shot. It went in his hip, and and narrowly missed the private parts. Well, we was going on up by this ridge there, <clears throat> and uh, the Japanese started bombing us, and, and we we saw this place here that was it's so like a, a in a outdoor bomb hole. It was up, and and it had a hole sort of a wide little wide space you could go in there right quick. Okay, so. We took this guy in there, and uh, we, I propped him up against this brick uh, rock wall there, and he wanted a cigarette. So I, I got a, got a, got a cigarette, and and uh, I lit it and started just as I was lighting it for him. Well, a terrific, terrific motor went off right behind us. And believe it or not, something, it, whatever, something came through my jacket and hit him in the mouth. And of course, he was, he had already been hurting, he was bleeding in his mouth. But I looked around, but I had, actually, when this happened, I, I, I remember, I screamed. And went right back in that opening to the outside there, where there, and, uh, and I, man, I was, I thought I never would hear again. And um, I heard these guys inside there then hollering, Corman, Corman. So I went rushed back in there. And it was three of us, cooks, and, and they, they all got hit. One of them was hit so bad his his right arm had twisted around about four or five times and it was just enough of the, a, like a rope left in his arm, you know. And and another another got hit real bad in the in the chest and but they they didn't, didn't any of us get killed. But later later on one of the guys I that, that that was still with us, one of the cooks. We were going up, going up, a, going up the hill for for another task, and they started raking that place over with the machine gun fire, and uh, the the hole he was in, he couldn't get his head down far enough, and he got a bullet right in in the, in the head, and it oozed out the back of his neck. And he was the only one of the nine that got killed. I was the last one of the nine that got wounded. And what was I? It was a, a sniper got me on the, on the when when everything was cool and we thought was everything was okay. But he'd come out of a darn hole over there, and and um, there was about nine of us over standing up. And he shot me in the shoulder. Luckily, he didn't get further over. <laughs> we were we were moving up, and uh, I crawled up one side of the tank. He was sitting with one our tank. He was sitting there, and, and uh, just as I got to the front end, it was it opened up a lot of fire for tank full of draw fire. Well, I made a, I made a unconscious move to get in front of the track. I went to put like this and get. And he started up moving. I just did get my arm back out. And he went over part of my shoulder. And uh, one night, a Jap tank, it, it, during the night, appeared out of nowhere. We didn't know he was anywhere around. And what happened was that we all saw and knew what it was because of the light, you know. The darn Japanese tank sitting right out there no more than 50 yards. 
somebody hollered, get old, uh, get old James with his bazooka. Well, he come up there and he knocked that. <laughs> he finished that guy off. And I almost got hit, well, hurt real bad by taking refuge behind a, a burned out Jap tank in the, in the bend of the road there where it was a sand at the, at this, in this road. <clears throat> and it was a burned out tank. It wasn't hot enough. But this uh, fellow and I, we saw this Yukon, recon truck coming down this little incline there, and and Japanese opened up fire on him, and all I could see was that windshield flying apart. And he come down there, and he, he was excited, and he was, he was trying to stop on our side, and what he did was the, the sand slid in there on us. And the other guy was pinned in so much that we had to, it was trouble getting him out. And my hat was was bent, <laughs> and no, from the from the truck bed, the truck bed what had to smash up against the tank. And uh, they had to take him back, and they asked me, did I did did I did I need to go back? And I said, no. I can stand it. I was crushed in my chest here a little bit. But I went on. We had a mission to go up toward the front line there. And uh, I, I don't remember what specific reason, but because I had so many, what, what they wanted me to do. I remember walking uh, through this on the way back and there was a bomb hole there, and it had a lot of sand in it. And and in that sand, some a a, laugh, a, a man was buried under that sand, and you could see just clear fluid surrounding that exact exact figure. You knew the man under that. It, and then war like that is so much. You, you can't imagine the smell, the noise, and the, and, and uh, it just, uh, uh, it's just so many things going on. But you have to keep carrying on. Mount sure about the, okay, this was a, it was a volcanic island in the Bonin Islands. Okay. They had built a lot of tunnels in that thing, and they had, I think, uh, four or five stories of rooms in that thing, and gun emplacements. They had gun emplacements where they had just a little piece to look out, and if you got in that gun sight, then it would get you. And uh, it was just, there was very few women in there. And, uh, and and they had to take that island because it was looking down on the people down below, to 550 feet above sea level. Of course, they up in the north end of the island, they had where they had these ranges was 360 foot. They had a lot of a lot of tunnels and stuff. And that Jap tank must have been. Covered up with something camouflage to be appeared to us so quickly. And uh, <coughs> I could just keep on and on. I was just, uh, my captain, he was the first one hit the, the day that uh, he, we actually got into combat, the second day we were on the island. He was from Birmingham, and he got shot in the leg, so they sent him back. So there were a lot of us guys that uh, had the leaders that were killed, and we had to sort of take over. There was a lot of that going on. Our 
company so decimated that they actually put me in the front lines. And two fellows and I, we got into a foxhole there, and that was one time whenever there was a, what the place called meat grinder. It was a lot of a lot of savage going on there. So I was in this place for for, for three days. And one one night, some machine gunner up there saved my life, or all three of us, because uh, they saw a Jap coming toward our foxhole. And we where did, where did this machine gun burst out there there in the middle of the night, you know, and 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 they they killed this Jap, and he fell right at the edge of our pool uh, box hole. <laughs> and uh, the tracers in that ammunition set his clothes afire. And you can imagine for three days or four how he got to smell it right there. And we couldn't we couldn't go. They were so good with that tunnel work. They could come out just about any place on the island. And after you done went past this place and and won this position, they could start shooting you in the back. They'd come out of those foxholes, not foxholes, uh, spider trap holes. Like spider, they'd open that thing up and there they are behind you. But I, but some of them, you could tell when they were firing from the back too. And they, they did that, they had this thing tunnels all over that place. They had 40 years to, to arm that place. And you know, they they bombed it for 72 consecutive days and nights. And it wasn't getting the jap. They were all in them holes and caves and tunnels. And that's what made it so bad when those men, our, the first and second, third wave got up on that beach, and all they had to do was open up those doors up on that mountain and look down on them there. It was bad. So we lost 10,000 men, too. But that was strategy for them. And I had to see. Uh, a, a man that had uh, had his wife picture and baby in his in his hat, you know, and that was laying inside him. It's things like that, you know. One of our sergeants on the mission list, uh, he he rolled over on on the grenade that fell in 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 their foxhole. There was he and two others was in this hole. Well, he naturally he. He covered it up, and his mission was to save their lives, but he lost his. We carried him back, but he didn't make it. Well, I, I, I was, uh, well, when I advanced, when everybody else did, but I, I was more or less in the rear bringing up stuff. And uh, on the last day, on uh, June the 14th, A K company was, they was, they was uh, come to relieve us. And we had to take a bunch of back and forth, take some of our equipment back. The K company was coming in there. Uh, that was the day that I got shot. And uh, I went, uh, I walked about uh, a mile and a half. Actually, this woman administered the supper and, and it got on a jeep and they took me all the way down to airfield number one which they had sort of like a little place down there like smashed a little hospital like thing and uh, I was laying there on that couch that night <coughs> hurting in the shoulder and hurting on this shoulder <laughs> and uh, I didn't feel like getting up until I started smelling coffee and donuts that got me up <laughs> 
well, it gave me points, but I think help for it. But I had already said that I would stay until the duration in six months. So, when did you go back home? Well, they, uh, they put me on in, in January 1946. I was lucky to get on this real big aircraft carrier Hornet, and they shipped me all the way back across to San Francisco. We went under the big bridge, and I was, it was real cold, frosty morning. It was fine. And I, I volunteered to work in the galley for those guys, and they'd let me work one day and be all free. <laughs> and I could go all over the ship. I had a pass, I could go on and get all the kind of food I wanted and everything. And that worked out fine. So uh, we stayed two, stayed two weeks, I believe, at, at, uh, at Treasure Island. And uh, then, they, then they shipped me, uh, left, left Oakland and went all the way across the United States to uh, Chicago and a four hour layover there. And then from there down, all, shipping all the way down to uh, Camp Lejeune, where I was discharged on on February the 11th, 1946. Uh, now, they was all real glad to see me. My dad picked me up at the bus station and he brought me home and we had a little celebrating. It, uh, I won't forget, my sister was scared when I walked in cause, and she ran on and hit on the bed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but and my, mother, my mother thought that I was bigger. She thought I had, she saw, they, they sent a picture of me getting a purple heart and I looked taller in that picture. But she was very glad to see me. She cry when she saw you? Did she? I don't remember. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> i tell you right now, if it wasn't for the, the, the greatest generation, they had such a task to do. The Marines going in to a place like that, loaded with Japanese, and we had to take it, and we did. Well, sure, I thought that would be the end of the war. And and for, as far as uh, a lot of us guys, we figured that if they hadn't dropped the bombs, we would not be alive today because we were already going to go to uh, 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 Right there near, they had a place for us already picked out to go. And they had all those Japanese children, women, each, every one of them was trained to, to, to throw grenades, and, and they were fighting devils too. And it, I, we just would not have been home. It would have been a slaughter for, we would have lost a million men. A hero is anyone who who does his duty and is a, is a patriot. He, he knows what he's got to do, and he's, he's to to help others. And I, I'm I'm just real proud that I was able to do what I could. Whatever. Well, uh, the Marines and Navy and all the people put together, we went to, to make a place for you kids and, your, and our mothers and fathers. And you, you want to you love your country, but you want to love your family too.